Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for turning up to the second of my interviews today uh, with another very exciting games industry figure and another person who's been sort of central to the games industry for the entire time I've been writing ab about it, and in this case, uh, quite a bit before as well. Phil Harrison. Um, as in 20 years at Sony, Phil was involved, was, was core to the, the launch of all, all the first three PlayStation consoles. And as head of Worldwide Studios, he's had a hand in pretty much every great Sony game that you could care to think of. Um, he's done much more besides just, just the main console companies, but he did later on move over to Microsoft, and he worked, worked for Xbox around the launch of the Xbox One, which must make you perhaps the only person who's worked on both sides, in, uh, in that kind of executive role, on both sides of that great rivalry. Would that be right? I think that's right. I worked out once that I, I was involved in the launch of some sort of console in the 80s, 90s, noughties and 10s, which I think, I don't know, there's very many other people who can, yeah. who can say that. But I think, I think in that sense, I mean, you know, Phil is one of the key figures in terms of shaping what we see as the modern console industry, because uh, for me, that kind of started with PlayStation, and it was pushed forward with Xbox and PlayStation 2, and I suppose in some, some degree, you're like the architect of the way my life has turned out as well, which is... Uh, Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, but yes, so, um, but since... Since, since kind of moving on from consoles and actually just even before you joined with Xbox, um, Phil is a very, very uh, prolific and successful investor um, and, not just in, and not in console companies but in mobile and social companies. I mean, you've been involved in some of the bigger exits of the last few years, I think, like you've had Supercell and Natural Motion and Playfish and that combined is Not Natural Motion and Playfish, but Supercell was one of mine. Oh, that was one of yours. Okay, yeah. so that's just London Venture Partners. Sorry, my mistake. I'm happy with Supercell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that was, that's kind of three quarters of all the value there anyway. But yeah, so I mean, Phil is a very, very experienced person with, with breadth and depth of experience in every kind of part of the games industry. So we will be having some questions at the end. So, you know, get your thinking caps on because it's kind of a rare opportunity to pick his brain. But I think you actually have uh, uh, something you'd like to say. Well, I wanted to say um, thank you for your patience. I was supposed to be here last year. Um, Ivan very kindly invited me to be part of this conference a year ago. But right before the conference, I fell off my mountain bike and broke my shoulder in four places and um, had just had surgery. I was on some really remarkably strong drugs, so I think it was probably um, a good idea that I didn't show up. But, I, st I strongly um, disagree with that. <laughs> I think you absolutely should. Uh, may sure. maybe, well, maybe I've just been carrying on ever since. But uh, it, thank you very much to the team. Um, everyone said I must come to Game Lab, and I've never been able to make it work until today, and I can see why this is a, a special conference and so thank you for the opportunity to be here and thanks to Matt for, for hosting today. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so yeah, I mean as I said, like you've got a wealth of experience. You've, you've touched every single part of the games industry but you know, what I would like to do is I'd like to start on something that's actually quite fresh in my mind as a journalist which is E3. Now E3 is this event, I mean obviously I'm sure everybody here watched it very closely. You watched all of the console companies get up there and, and do their thing. I mean the thing that struck me about E3 this year is that more, more than ever before, I feel, I feel like this, this doesn't really reflect the way that the industry has changed, particularly in like your time working in the industry, your 20 years at Sony, the, the decade or so since then, your involvement in mobile and, and so on and so forth. Like The industry has changed massively in the 10 years I've been a journalist, and yet when we have a show like E3, and I don't think it's just E3, but I feel like that what dominates the conversation, what dominates, you know, the, the, the kind of the focus is still this 90% of its console, 90% of its core. What, what, is your, what was your feeling around I that? think it's self-fulfilling. E3, remember, was put together as a retail trade show. You know, that's how it started life in the, uh, the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And it is a small window into the video game market, by no means the only window. And I think if you view E3 just through the lens of the conferences that are streamed, they've become somewhat skewed over time because you've got Sony and Microsoft both have this challenge. They've got a few thousand people in a room, 500 hardcore game fans. They definitely want to satisfy those fans. They want to be getting lots of 
um, high marks on the whooping and hollering scale. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're all very familiar with that as you, as do, you watch it. Do they it. ship people in for that? Can you give us that inside information? The, they incentivize fans yeah. to come. I mean, I, depend, I don't know exactly how both companies do it these days, but I don't think they pay people to whoop and holler. I don't think you get a check if you do more yeah. whoops and more hollers than yeah. anybody else. But, <laughs> I mean, there's definitely a desire to make the room buzzy, yeah. and I get that. There's definitely another audience who's watching at home via streaming, um, you know, effectively a television program. And then there is probably 50 to 100 analysts and journalists in the room who really matter. And so you've got this sort of multi-headed beast. And I don't think E3 can satisfy all of those constituents uh, comfortably. Yeah. Whereas you come to a show like Gamescom and you've got a much more consumer focus. And I think that's actually a really healthy uh, way of, of showcasing the industry. Yeah, no, I agree. Now, I know, um, Phil, that you... You have two, two boys, right? You have two, two young sons. And so I, want, I do wonder is if that has changed the way you look at this. Because one thing about E3 that is ever present, and I don't want it to just be about E3, but I think E3 is broadly representative of what's actually on consoles, is, is that there's a high level of, there's high level of, vi it's a very like, mature market. It it's is. It's a mature core market. You, I mean, you've worked in consoles, you have, these, you have children now, and has that changed the way you consume games? Has it totally. changed the way you look at, look at your, your professional life as well? Totally. I mean, it, I'm very careful about the media that we consume inside the home because of, of having um, two boys, six and eight, who is basically the best focus group for mobile games you could ever mm -hmm. possibly have. But in, in the kind of early days of console, think of it as a pyramid divided into three sections. You had core games at the top, you had this kind of mid-core in the middle, and then um, social and, and um, more mass market games at the bottom. Well, that's all gone to mobile, that yeah. bottom layer. The middle layer's kind of disappeared, and console is really only left with that, that more hardcore um, uh, market. And if you look at the last few conferences from all of the platform holders, from, from both notably from Sony and Microsoft, it's like when you start the conference, it's how many seconds elapse until the first throat stab or how <laughs> many seconds elapse until the first arrow goes into yeah. the eye. And is that really the, the view of the world that we want to be well, portraying yeah, I mean, as an it, industry? It, it, it's, it's something that I've noticed. Um, I, I, did, I, wrote, I wrote an opinion piece, not that I didn't talk too much about things I've done because... I'm um, interviewing Phil, but but you know, but the, but I did observe like that. That you do tend to get like the year of the crossbow, the year of you know the the face stab or the arrow in the eye or whatever. There there is that kind of sense that people are all moving in a very similar direction. And you know, we're talking about E3 here, but I don't think this is just about no, E3. It's not. I think this is, this is about what the console market is. And I also think that this kind of thing is is gonna is gonna lay the path for its future, like where it's gonna go from here. Well, let's let's make it more broad. Let's just look at the roughly 40 years that computer games have been around. Go back in time to 1927, when the very first talkie movie happened, and then wind the clock forward 40 years from that point, and look at the movies that came out in 1967 and 1968, the movies that won Oscars or were considered the best released movies of 67 and 68. It's Cool Hand Luke, it's... Um, um, the Jungle Book, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, um, uh, In the Heat of the Night, the movies which are still considered classics today, mm -hmm. yeah. telling rich, deep stories, old, young, male, female, family, not, you know, Bullet, that was a movie yeah. that came out in, I think, 1967. So no, it's not all about soft family stories. Um, and now look at 40 years of video games. Are we evolving at the same rate yeah. in terms of our rich storytelling and our rich characters. Those are some of the themes and questions that I'm interested in exploring as, a, yeah. as an investor and, and as the industry, I think, should be asking itself. Yeah, I mean, is that, I mean, is that related to, 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 to the way that family has changed your outlook? I mean, is it, does, does that give you more interest in, in, in facilitating the creation? It of should do, because, you know, we now have an industry which is, or uh, an audience for our... Um, output as an industry, um, which is measured in the billions. You know, if you take all the mobile devices, all the consoles, all the PCs, all the ways in which you can play, the opportunities to play are now measured in, in the billions. Um, and demographically, it's, you know, as diverse, geographically, it's as diverse as you could be. 
And so I think we have a responsibility to use that power of audience mm -hmm. um, uh, for good. You yeah. know, where are the protest songs yeah, yeah, of no, games? Right, you know, that's yeah. a really um, fun topic to have. You know, which games have really delved deeply into social issues or yeah. into diverse... And of course, there are some yeah. examples. I think in the last few years, particularly, you've started to see that sort of emerge, and particularly on the, the indie scene. I'm not specifically talking mobile here, but say like on, on, on PC through Steam, games like Papers, Please, and yep. Part Life, they're, 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 and, I, and I, think, I think what that's showing you is there is actually, there is actually like, there's a gulf for new content and new experiences that hasn't quite been filled by either side. I mean, and so maybe I want to dig into that a little bit. I mean, so, I mean, this is the thing. So I think across the whole industry, you do have diversity within the audience. I don't think you necessarily have that, and you may disagree with me here, I don't think you necessarily have that diversity of audience on the console side. And I do wonder if that is an issue for the console companies going forward, whether, whether that in the future is, is going to hurt them. Uh, because the, the games industry has grown and it has changed, and most of the growth has come outside of that sort of what, what is now an aging core demographic. Well, I think that's true, and I think if you look at the former business models up to about PlayStation 2, the, the model was to keep the platform um, stable, but reduce the price of the hardware, augmented by some broader software offerings, therefore enhancing the market mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, now we're seeing the price point staying the same, mm -hmm. but the performance going up. Yeah. It's a very different model, and so the price of entry is still quite high. Um, the content is definitely, you know, the increasingly the top of that yeah. top of that pyramid. But but so do you think that that I mean could could that be see, could that be described as a mistake though? So I mean you said that you got the because for example, SingStar is a perfect example of the kind of product that Sony was putting out to satisfy this kind of broader market. I mean, uh, obviously Nintendo is slightly different. It's got the Switch, and it seems to I, I think it's doing a very good job with that. It's a very interesting concept. But I mean it. Do you think it would be smarter to, to, to still appeal to that market, or is it just like a lost battle now because no, I don't think, mobile I don't think exists? It's lost at all. Um, I thought, although I haven't seen it personally, I th thought the announcements around PlayLink, Play Link, which yeah. I believe is the name of it, the, yeah. the Sony uh, mobile phone connected to the console, I thought that was a really interesting way of kind of reigniting that yeah. in-home couch social yeah, uh, play. Just slightly buried almost, you know, uh, underneath everything else. I think, well, you've got know. to satisfy the whoopers and hollerers in <laughs> yeah, the audience. Indeed, and if yeah. you're not getting... Uh, hard to whoop about There's not playing, enough throat yeah. stabs in it. Yeah, yeah indeed, indeed. Um, but so, I mean, uh, which, which platform for you then is the most important in terms of future growth of the games industry, in terms of new gamers coming in? I mean, because if we're mobile. looking... Mobile. Mobile, without a doubt. Without hesitation. I think the... The ubiquity of the device, the um, democratization of development tools, um, the ability to stand up a game in, in days, not months or years, you know, I think that is, that is going to drive content. Um, obviously, discovery is an issue. There's mm -hmm. too much content to, to just be on the store. You can't just release it and hope people will find it. You have to drive discovery. Um, but, you know, that's always been the the, the issue is just in the past, we didn't call it discovery, we called it marketing or PR. And yeah. I think, you know, there's been um, uh, kind of an assumption from the development community that um, marketing just happens. And I think now that developers are having to do it themselves, they've realized that it's a challenge. Yep. Um, but but long term, um, I'm looking at the post mobile world, mm -hmm. what happens when new technologies come along that are going to supplant mobile particularly in, um, in the wearable or ambient computing side. Right. Um, but for the time being, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be mobile. Yeah, I mean, so when, so when you see, th you know, so you, know, you just referred to it, when you see the, this kind of this new concept of like mid-generation hardware upgrades in the console, in the console market, Xbox One X, PS4 Pro, I mean, that, that to you, that's not, that, that, that's not about expanding anything. Then. That, that's just about catering in a different way to the same group of people. Yeah, I, I, it will, I think both Sony in particular and Microsoft are doing a great job with their, with the sales of these next generation devices, certainly better than many industry pundits would have predicted back mm -hmm. in um, 2011, 12. Yep. You know, I think everyone said 
consoles dead. Consoles it's all dead. going to be about the iPad and you know forget uh, forget new consoles. So I, I think that both companies have done a, a very good job in light of of the the market dynamic. Um, but to answer your specific question, where is the macro growth going to come from? It's going to be mobile in the, yeah. in the foreseeable future. Yeah, it's going to be mobile. Now, so, I mean, because obviously mobile, I expected you to say mobile, I must say, because mobile is the largest audience out there, and it is, I would say, the most diverse audience out there as well. And you've spoke, spoken to some of these problems just now, but the marketplace, I mean, it is, it does have its difficulties, and I suppose everything does. I mean, there's copy copycatting is, is, is a bit of an issue. Discovery is obviously a bit of an issue. And then you have the, the, a, small, a, a fairly small number of very, very big games, many of which were, you know, were, were made years ago, you yeah. know, like 2011, 2012, 2013. That's kind of the period where a lot of what dominates the, 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 the revenue charts, at least, There's a really big out. problem that there can yeah. only be 10 games in the top 10. Yes. That is a <laughs> real problem. And I think the, the war chest that the likes of Supercell, Machine Zone, and others, um, uh, King, and a few others have developed, they've developed not only the cash war chest, but also the skills of understanding how to dial up and down yeah. the performance marketing. And they can dial it down to the point where their gross margin goes up and that they are enjoying excellent profits from, from these games. And then when competition starts to come up from below, they can just turn back up the customer acquisition and marketing and they can maintain their position. You've seen that a lot in the slightly dynamic nature of the charts, but it's still relatively stable. Yeah. There's definitely opportunities in the lower reaches of the charts. I'm not saying that that is um, lost, but I think these companies now have such skills in understanding performance marketing and the cash to sit behind it, um, that it's going to be hard to, to supplant them. Yeah, no, I, I was told by um, the, the head of Green International that, that you know, digital marketplaces often have these sort of tipping effects in that direction. That once you have, and that, that these games almost become genres unto themselves. And like once that game is doing that, it's basically, it's almost like scorched earth for everybody else. Like it's very, very hard to gain any leverage or to really, really compete on that same level with them. I think that's right, and uh, it does make me laugh that the, um, the the Clash of Clans sword shows up so many places elsewhere on the App Store, or the Clash of Clans King shows up so many other places. I don't know if Miko is in the audience, but you guys should probably trademark a design <laughs> around that sword, because it gets everywhere. And you can just see why people do that, because they want to try and convince or confuse players into thinking that that game is somehow associated. Um, so there is a lot of copycat, but that's always the way it's been. Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. I mean, one thing that, that I mean, I was, you know, I was a journalist when the iPhone was launched. I was a journalist when the App Store emerged. And I think one of the ideas that was quite wide, that I certainly discussed with my, my colleagues at the time, was this, uh, was this concept that you would get, over time you would get um, mobile gamers would, would sort of start moving over to PC, would start moving over to console, console gamers and and historically PC gamers would, would play more and more mobile games. I mean, do you think that that kind of fluidity of movement actually happens? I mean, it, 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 I, I, it's hard to say in a, in a broad sense from a journalist point of view because it, 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 I, I only really have my own subjective view of the matter. I think there is a time and a place for different devices. And physically, there is obviously a place for the console in the living room or in the den and the opportunity to play on mobile is, is driven by you're waiting for a coffee, you're waiting for a bus, you're yeah. on a train, all those kind of use cases. Um, but I don't think the same games necessarily flow seamlessly across all of those devices. Microsoft is definitely trying to blend the PC and the console into one platform, and I can understand why they would want to do that from, from their point of view. Um, and certainly that will increase the top of funnel um, for those games and for those players. Um, but I think that the market is, is fragmented and, and will become further fragmented when we talk about the real um, critical mass of VR and whatever happens yeah. in the future beyond that. Yeah, I mean, so I'm d we I want to get on to VR, but one more question remember, Does the mobile market, in from a games perspective, still interest you as an investor? Or does it interest you as much as it used to? Uh, I think the opportunities in mobile are limited, um, although you only have to look at the 
performance of the Nintendo Switch to kind of mm -hmm. get a view into what the future of mobile is going to be like. Yeah, I mean, because I wanted to, well, we did want to talk to you about that, that not, not the Switch specifically, but the concept that the Switch embodies, that kind of that fusion of like portable and connected TV experience that can kind of do both things. Yeah, I, I got a Switch day one, uh, mainly because I'm a Zelda fan, so for me it was you like a, quite happy with that, it was a kind it? of Zelda delivery device, yeah, yeah. and I didn't... <laughs> I, I didn't think of um, uh, of Switch as being um, a fully rounded console, and nor did I believe the idea before I got it into the house of the literally the switching of the mode between yeah. running it on a TV and running it as a handheld. And with my kids, I, I realised actually that's a genius element of the of the design of the hardware, and it does work, you know, as uh, much better than I expected. Having said that. I think Nintendo missed a really wonderful design opportunity with mm -hmm. when the, the console is, is um, docked inside that dock. There's about 12 pixels along the top of the screen that you can see. They should have done something with that to yeah. allow you to have some secondary uh, data, uh, secondary screen experience back. It's just a piece of plastic. There's no. Yeah, yeah. They could have. All right, maybe they needed to block off some of the GPU. I get that, but maybe they could have just activated the top 64 pixels or something. And that, to me, felt. There's a couple of things on the Switch which felt like they were just a little bit rushed. Yeah. And that if they had had a chance to kind of sit back and look at it, they would have done it differently. Having said that, I think Zelda is an absolute work of art. Yeah. And will win every game of the year accolade yeah. that it. Deserve it and then so this, this is the kind this is the kind of rich deep storytelling that you were mentioning earlier when you kind of drew that parallel to, to the to the what I think is a golden age of cinema yeah I, I mean I think that obviously the Zelda universe is drawing on what is it 20 years of yeah. um, uh, maybe more of, least, of, yeah. of, of games now um, and so uh, but boy is that a beautifully put together bit of um, content my other game of the year for last year would be probably inside. I don't know uh, if Dino is in Dino the audience. Dino might he's be around. in here somewhere. Um, but yeah. I'll, I'll let him know anyway. I'll meet him later. Um, I thought that was absolutely fantastic for the reason that I wanted to know more about the story and the characters and the place. I don't know if anybody else had that experience. When you played the game and finished the game, you actually felt that there were more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a delightful thing. Most games try and package it all up, put a bow on the top and say, yeah. here you go. Whereas inside, I was like, that, I want to know more. I want to do that again. I want to go find out what, yeah. what that character was about. Yeah. Now, so to, to return quickly to something you, you, you know, a comment you made earlier, you said that these kinds of that, that kind of rich storytelling experience, these these new kind of storytelling experiences, that interests you from a professional perspective, from a, from an investment perspective. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think that we are we we're sitting in this golden age of of democratization of platforms, democratization of technology to make content. In the past, you know, when I first started out, 80% of your development budget would be writing your 3D engine and you'd have to throw that away every time you wrote another game. It would be almost like a filmmaker throwing away the Panavision camera at yeah. the beginning of a film and reinventing another camera each time they went to make a film. And so we've got to this point where the tools are there, the reach is there, uh, the distribution is there, um, the ability to stand up a, a, an online service on AWS or Microsoft or Sony or whatever is, is there. And we can now start thinking about what happens when you have very believable worlds, very believable graphics mixed with very sophisticated AI. Yeah. What happens when those two worlds coexist? Yeah. That's an interesting future. Yeah, so because this, this uh, reminds me of comments that um, EA's Andrew Wilson made over, over the course of E3. He was talking about how he thought that machine learning and neural networks were actually going to have an absolutely massive impact on the way the games are made and the way the games actually just play out in terms of the user experience. Do you have any, uh, do you have any knowledge of that, that area? Yeah, I think he's right. I think that um, it, that is the next frontier of game design where you aren't necessarily using... Um, scripted design, but you're using algorithmic design to mm -hmm. achieve um, a surprising and delightful outcome for the player. Um, and I think if you take all of the inputs, what Andrew was talking about was, um, if I remember correctly, kind of taking every Hollywood uh, war film that was yeah. ever made and to kind put of every war story ever written yeah, sort into of feeding it, that and then into it could generate procedurally new stories based on player behaviour, based on other things. I think the vision is 
extraordinary. Yeah. I think there are some challenges around you know, funneling that data, cleaning that data, making a machine be able to learn from it. Um, and as with anything, this is not my quote, but I think this is a Bill, Gu Bill Gates quote, which is that we massively overestimate what we can do in two years and we massively <laughs> underestimate what happens in 10 years. Yeah, yeah. So I think that what Andrew is talking about is gonna be somewhere in that two to 10 year window. Yeah, because one of the things he said, in case anyone hasn't seen it, I think it was on Glixel, the website, and it's really worth it reading that interview because it, you know, it's one of those things that gets you very excited about what's coming up. But he said that, that in the next five years, games will change as much as they've changed in the last 45 years, which kind of speaks to what you were just saying, right? Like how far have we moved on in the last 40 years? And then maybe, this period coming up, this next 10 years, that could be, that could, that could change an awful lot about I'm excited about that. And in the same way that I, li I like what happened to the way television was made because of Netflix. You know, Netflix changed totally the business model and dynamics of, of television. The best writers from Hollywood came over to make television programs and that's why all of the great shows that we watch are yeah. on streaming television now, not on terrestrial TV. And I hope that that same tipping effect will happen with all of the things I just talked about, this kind of golden age and the, mm -hmm. the, the, the availability of the tools that, you know, let's hope that we can engender the next generation of, of writers and creators to, to think about the medium in that way. Yeah, and then I, I think it, there's the opportunity to bring in new voices and new ways of looking at things because with, with these kinds of tools, and I mentioned, you know, improbable on stage, but they're, they're trying to kind of make a platform for, for creating these like detailed, rich, physical worlds. I mean, that, that could allow new voices to emerge and it could allow new, new perspectives to come through in games that I think maybe that, that's why we have that kind of fairly distinct gulf in, in, in the content we have. Something happened yesterday, which I think will be looked back on in a really uh, kind of momentous point in, in human existence. There are two billion people on Facebook as of yesterday. Oh, wow. and you know, that just kind of screws with your mind a little bit to think about the size of that. But yeah. then you think about the data that sits behind those two billion people and the interactions between those two billion people and what that means for algorithmic development of, of experiences. And Facebook is going to be in a very, very powerful position. Yeah. I mean, so let's, let's dig into that, uh, the post-mobile world then. I mean, am ambient technology. I mean, how... Does that relate to games, or is that, is, that, is that a kind of a separate thing for you from, from the games? It business? does relate to games, because so many of the skill sets that are in this room and, and around the game development community are transportable into that new world. Yeah. You know, user interaction, making content believable, not necessarily real, but believable, um, and um, understanding storytelling and, and interactions between the two. I think you know, those are skills that are highly transportable into this kind of new world of, of, you know, Hilmar talking about that this morning in terms of the, the kind of metaverse and, and mm -hmm. virtual worlds. Um, uh, our value as an industry is, is going to be incredible in, in that new world order. Yeah. Well, because no, I, I do wonder about, I mean, the, what you're talking about here, these new experiences, because my experience, I mean, you know, we're all, everyone in this room is a gamer, you're a gamer, I'm a gamer, and of course we are. We exist in this kind of bubble of gamers. But honestly, like, not a lot of my friends are gamers. And I think what they do is they look at or games... Or at least they don't admit to it. Or, they, or maybe they don't admit to it or identify as such. But yep. also that there, there's, there's a great many of them who are all, you know, cultured people. They love movies, they love music, they read books, all that stuff. When they see a game like Bioshock or whatever, like they, they love the way it looks, they love the way it sounds, they love the characters and the setting and the story, and they don't want to shoot anyone, though. And it's kind of like a barrier. And they don't want to do skill-based tests. But I think... The, the technology you friends, I think. That's <laughs> well, <fine. laughs> I, I certainly need I certainly need destiny partners if anyone's interested in that. <laughs> but I mean, but one thing they are interested in though is virtual reality. I mean, yep. and, and I know you are. I think you're announcing today the. Um, is that right? The yeah, we d I just made a small investment? Uh, an investment in a small um, AR VR startup called yeah. Dream Reality Interactive, a London-based um, company. Some ex Sony people that I. Uh, had worked with before, who yeah, are a yeah. brilliant team, and um, we just made a, a small announcement today about their their off and running with their their new company. Yeah. But but what appeals to what what appeals to the people I know who really have no had no interest in mobile games or console games or or any of the the new kind of growth that's happened is its capacity not just for immersion, which I think is what kind of knocks every 
knocks us out at first, but the capacity for, for social interaction and the capacity for experiences that aren't really based on tests of dexterity or skill or anything like that, that they see that there's a genuinely potential for something completely new from that, for something that maybe they can relate to more. Totally. It, it, that's your interest in that market as well. I think virtual reality is the appetizer, and I think augmented reality is the main course. Yeah. I think we will transition from one to the other relatively seamlessly over the next five to ten years, and we will end up ten years from now. So it's really interesting. It, you, you mentioned um, the iPhone. It's ten years ago that the iPhone was introduced and just under 10 years that the app store was introduced. So nobody could think of a mobile market being as big as it is today yeah, 10 years ago. And so I think if you were to use the same analogy, VR is in the WAP period of mobile phone. If anybody here has ever developed a, a WAP mobile game, you will know what that means. Um, but the kind of pre-iPhone inflection point. Um, I don't think the main players are on the stage yet for yep. VR and AR, or at least... On the, the hardware side? On the hardware the, yeah. side. Um, I think we're a ways off um, getting to uh, mass consumer adoption on that. Um, but definitely, you look at who are who is involved. You've got Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Apple, Samsung. Yeah. You know, you've got some pretty strong balance sheets who are all betting on uh, some kind of mixed reality, mixed media future, yeah. and I think that's going to be good. So when people talk about, I mean, the, I think John Riccatiello, the Unity CEO, former, uh, you know, former CEO of EA, he talks about this thing, the gap of disappointment that we're kind of in right now with VR, where it kind of, it, it was massively hyped for a few years, it came out, and as m almost everybody involved with VR said, it was a slow start, but that didn't stop people starting to feel disappointed. I mean, you just listed effectively, you know, seven or eight of the biggest companies on earth, right? Mm -hmm. And they're all there and they're all backing it. That, do you think, in your opinion, that is what's going to make it sort of an inevitable thing, that it's going to happen eventually? Really? Yeah, I think there are there's two... No, there's no fail state for that. I, uh, yes, of course there is a failed state if, if everything disappoints. But yeah. I think these are solvable problems, some of which are solved by natural progression of Moore's law. Most of the VR hardware that's out there today doesn't use custom silicon to a great degree, mm -hmm. um, doesn't use custom optics to a significant degree, and I think the next generation of VR and AR experiences are all going to be built on very, very custom optics and um, uh, special silicon for en enriching not just what you see but what you sense right. around you. Um, and I think that those are... Um, multi-year bets. I don't think they're all going to be launched tomorrow, no. um, but there are definitely some big companies in the wings who are going to be um, uh, bringing some incredible experiences into this market. One of the big problems that you have to solve, you look at something like HoloLens as a device, um, one of the biggest design challenges for HoloLens is actually dealing with thermal output of a big computer strapped to your head. Yeah, right, yeah. And so those are some of the big challenges that need to be overcome in the, in the next few generations of, yeah. of these devices. But we will get to that point that Hilmar was talking about this morning of that convergence of you know, the, 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 the kind of hardcore immersive VR and that little 2D experience that you get on Snapchat and those two things kind of converging <laughs> yeah, to right. one that you wear and don't notice. Yeah, and, but, and I think you know, when you, even in the last two years, you can really see that there is, there is progress being made just in terms of the, I mean, Hilmar talked about this new game, they're making Spark, and their first game was a seated experience, it was flying around, you could play it with a pad, and this new one is, it's moving your arms, and it's, and it's tracking your body, and it feels like you're far more immersed in the world. Valve's just started shipping the dev kit for its new controller, which tracks all five of your yep. fingers, and it rests on your hands, so you can actually now pick up an object like that, and that, that's in the space of a year and a half, and I think that shows that Totally. A year and a half to go, two years, three years' time, the kinds of experiences that the ability to track all five fingers could open up. I mean, just that completely changes the game. I, think. I agree. Yeah. I mean, so are you actually a VR player? Do you, do, do you own any of this hardware, or is it more that you just see the potential of the market? I do, and I, I think I've had a few of those experiences uh, you know, where you are deep into a VR world. You take off the headset and you have this sense of disappointment that you're back in the real world. Mm -hmm. And I think those 
kind of moments are increasing in frequency. There's still a lot of gaps of the valley of disappointment between yep. them, but the, those peaks of excitement are getting higher and higher frequency. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's good. And uh, a company like DRI is approaching this problem with some really interesting tech and, and talent to try and uh, kind of make those leaps. Yeah, and, but, and you know, and DRI is not only working on games. And I do wonder, like, where games are a big part of VR right now, and I think they probably will be driving it forward in the future. Hilmar made this point as well. But when, it, uh, when, it, when, when that switch, that seamless switch to AR you mentioned happens, and later down the road VR, where do you think games are actually going to fit in? Like, is that st is how big a driver is that going to be? Because the potential, I mean, because these are platforms, they're not specific, you know, pieces of hardware we're talking about, VR and AR, the potential applications are vast. I think games will continue to be front and center of these technologies. Um, you know, the, 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 the prices of these devices is going to be quite high to begin with, mm -hmm. and I think games is going to be a, a good driver of early adoption. Um, and I think you only have to look at the announcements from the major players. Games is always part of the story that they tell. Yeah. Um, so I think that's super positive for, for everybody in this room and beyond. Yeah. But Bam, for you, AR is kind of where we're going. The, the VR maybe is, you know, is going to fill in the gap while that AR technology, while you solve, while some of those hardware problems are solved. I think the, the utility of AR, usability of AR, meaning you can see the real world, you can see real people, and then it's augmented with additional data. That, to me, feels like a much longer uh, opportunity than a fully immersive VR, which I think is going to be extraordinary for a small, smaller number of people. Yeah. Um, and so if I'm talking about you know, billions of users, I think it's going to be AR that achieves that. Yeah. And so as a last point, I mean, something just to, so you can maybe go, go a little bit out there with, with, with your answer. But I mean, we've talked about a lot of different kinds of technology that are all emerging from ambient post-mobile technology to, you know, um, tools to create virtual worlds and VR and AR. I mean, it, and you, you talked about the kind of the, the, the role that data could play in AI. I mean, are we, are we moving towards a future where all of these things effectively are all going to just work together? That we can that the, the games that should be making products that actually draws on all of these different things, combines them. I don't think there's going to be one platform. Mm. I don't think that is ever going to happen because of the competing nature of, of technologies of hardware, software, and service, and account and billing and all of those things. You know, I think Apple's always going to want you to have yeah. be a part of their billing world, and Google will want you to be part of their billing world, and Microsoft and others will will try and compete as well. Um, but I do think as a game developer, your access to these mature services very quickly is going to mean you can spend more and more of your available development resources on the things that matter, character, story, place, mm. emotion, you know, and, and I think that's ultimately a, a, a wonderful win-win, not just for the development community, but for the consumer as well. Yeah, indeed, I agree. Well, we've got about five minutes for questions, so if anybody has one, there's already a hand there. Yeah, I go. Hello. Uh, first of all, I hope your shoulder is okay. Thank you for asking. My shoulder's much better, thank you. <laughs> I turned into the bionic man, so I have a bit of metal in my shoulder, but I don't beep in airports, which is very unfortunate. I'm glad to hear it. Um, what I want to say is I sometimes feel like the video games public is very polarized. In one hand, you have uh, hardcore gamers that buy consoles and PCs and watch the E3 and YouTube gameplays. And on the other hand, you have the so-called casual gamers that are uh, the target of a lot of companies, uh, especially mobile companies but they are part of, uh, of the industry, they are consumers. But I feel like a lot of them are not aware that they are players or they do not want to admit it, like you said. For instance, my father, he despises video games, but he plays video games. He plays chess online every day. And he used to play a lot match free games like Candy Crush in his, with his tablet a lot. But he will tell you that he doesn't like video games, he doesn't play video games. Video games are for kids and teenagers and millennials and freaks. 
Uh, <laughs> and you, we should celebrate that. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> and it's kind of frustrating. Um, my question is, what is in video games that still alienates so many people, even if technically they do play video games? I think there's two things that alienate people. And, and I spent a lot of time looking at this when I was at Sony and we were developing iToy and SingStar and Buzz, the more social um, products that we launched. And to put it simply, if you hand a game controller to many players, it's like you've handed them a hand grenade with the pin taken out. Hmm. Because they're like, I, I, do, I don't know what to do with this thing. Please take it away from me. But if you hand them a microphone, they know ex instinctively what to do with it. You hand them a, a controller which has one button on it, they know what to do with mm -hmm. it. And I think if we can eliminate that fear of failure and embarrassment from um, the user experience, we can continue to grow the market. So that's number one. And number two, I think it's down to content. You know, I think if the first thing that your father sees is a character being stabbed in the throat, you know, maybe he's not going to feel so, you know, warm and cuddly about the, um, the experience. And I mean, I, I would just add to that, and I, I think that, that the VR and AR probably do have some a part to play in that as well, because that it, you know, that's a revolution of input as much as anything else. You know, when, when you're interacting and, you, and you've got your hands trapped, there's no, I mean, I said earlier on that it's not skill-based anymore. There's something totally natural about doing that. And there's not, as you say, that kind of fear of the pad of all the buttons and, and, and the sticks, you know, so. Is there uh, anyone else? Okay. Yeah, I'm really loud. <laughs> I can repeat the question, go ahead. It's coming over there. Yeah, so following up on that uh, social experience out there, everyone plays, but they don't consider themselves gamers. And you know, back in console game days, you had to build things like uh, PlayStation Network or Xbox Live. And suddenly you see that even though in mobile you will find Google Play game services or like iOS suddenly deprecated game centers, they don't have that. Do you think there is a future of uh, connected gaming or it's uh, already connected by default and we don't need to connect games under umbrellas within networks or something like that. Like, is there a need for another network like that? Would you build one uh, through the social? Like, what's, like, from yeah. your background of PSN? Like? I think it's, uh, to build a synchronous network on mobile is hard, um, but what Supercell has built for their games as a asynchronous network, um, you know, they have 100 million daily active users. Just think about that for a second. 100 million people interacting with a game on a daily basis and some multiple of that on a, <coughs> on a monthly basis. You know, so tho tho the, the numbers of people that are part of a community, in those games, the community is more, more important, a micro community is more important to them than a macro community. Um, we could talk about that all day, but I think that right now it's, it's community built around games and experiences rather than across games that seems to be um, prevailing. So we've probably got time for one more question, I would say, if anybody still has one. Look. I think that might be. Oh, over there? Yeah. Hello. Hello. First of all, thanks for coming to Barcelona. I think it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. I love <laughs> it. Um, looks like uh, mobile gaming is like over. Creativity is not trying to pull something better now. Do you think still room in mobile gaming for experiences that are, are like meaningful? Like imagine an extre extreme example, something like Zelda in a mobile game? Yeah, I, I, I hope so is the short answer. I think um, Monument Valley I haven't played Monument Valley 2, but I think Monument Valley 1 was a, was a great example of, of a place and a space that you want to be in and go back to. Um, and I hope that there will continue to be stories of depth that are, that are told on, on mobile. Um, but um, there aren't as many of them yet as, as you would hope for. Yeah, 
I think that's all. So if everybody could uh, put your hands together for Phil Harrison, please. Thank you very much. <laughs>